Hello, Michael? Hi, Robert. Hi there. How are you doing? Yes, not too bad, thanks. I can hear you better now. Thank you. Oh, that's good. I think maybe the headset's better suited to the other phone. Right. OK, good. OK. Yeah. Good. So how can I help you? Um, well, I, I was reading your book, Enjoy Life Forever, which I downloaded from the yeah. JW.org website. And I was uh -huh. curious about the statement that the Holy Spirit is God's active force. Um, mm -hmm. Perhaps it might be best to read section four. Um, mm -hmm. it's, pa it's chapter six, but it's section four. It says, Holy Spirit, God's active force. Section 4. Could you just give me the reference again? I've got the book yes. in front of me. It's here. Enjoy Life Forever. Yeah, I've got that. Yeah. Chapter mm -hmm. 7, Section 4. Oh, seven. It says Holy okay. Spirit, God's Active Force. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and then um, that seems a strange statement to you. Well, it doesn't define what an active force is. Would you like to read it, or should I read it, or just that little paragraph? Yeah, as we use our hands to do our work, uh, Jehovah uses his Holy Spirit. The Bible reveals that Holy Spirit is not a person, but the force God uses to get things done. Uh, so we've got a couple of references. We've got Luke 11, 13. Um, so if you, although being wicked, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more so will the Father in heaven give Holy Spirit to those asking him? And Acts 2 and verse 17. And in the last days God says, I will pour out some of my Spirit on every sort of flesh, and your sons and daughters will prophesy, and your young men will see visions, and your old men will dream dreams. So it's an interesting idea. If you look at Luke uh, Would you passages, like to, could, could we read the paragraph, please? Is that possible? So, we, you know, we yeah, read that? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, uh, okay, so we'll do that and then discuss these questions. Uh, God will pour out his Holy Spirit on those who ask for it. So do you think Holy Spirit is a person or is it God's active force? Why do you say that? In other words, can you fill a person with another person? Can you give a person to another person? Um, Jehovah uses his Holy Spirit to accomplish amazing things. Uh -huh. Read Psalm 33, 6 and 2 Peter 1, 20 to 21, and then discuss this question. What are some ways in which Jehovah has used his Holy Spirit? Mm -hmm. um, to my knowledge, the Bible never calls the Holy Spirit an active force anywhere in the Bible in the original Greek or Hebrew text. And there's no translation by, by scholars, by people with PhDs in Greek or Hebrew, who've translated... Ruach or Numa as God's active force, um, and the term is just not defined. What is a person? What is an active force? And what's the difference between them? That's what really puzzled me, um, oh, okay. Michael. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, I suppose if you think about it, I mean, elsewhere the Holy Spirit is referred to in other ways, um, or God's making something happen, as you refer to as God's hand or God's finger, um, and and him acting in this way um, would be seen as being kind of uh, his active force, his Holy Spirit acting um, upon the world. Um, and uh, to me, that's the idea that's being expressed there, that um, you know, God uses his Holy Spirit in that way. So what is an active force, and what is a person, and what is the difference between them? What is the difference? Well, a person would have, shall we say, personality, um, whereas an active force is rather less personal. Right, OK. Because as I've looked at the JW.org site, you, you claim that God yeah. the Father is a spirit mm -hmm. and he's person mm -hmm. or personal mm -hmm. um the mm -hmm. sun rose as a spirit creature and i wouldn't believe that but you say the sun rose as a spirit creature so he's a spirit and he's a person yeah first peter 3 18 says that he was raised in the spirit um i don't want to could i just finish yeah. my point that, that, that's just, that's it, it, just it doesn't say he say was no it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't say that in that, in that verse but let me just finish my my point mm -hmm. okay. um, 
angels are spirits in your literature um, and they're individual spirits and they're individual persons the demons and satan are each individual spirits and they're individual persons but then you go to the holy spirit and you say the holy spirit is a spirit but he's not a person and i i, I didn't understand that because it seemed a bit inconclusive it, it it seemed a bit inconsistent and what exactly is an active force and what is a person and what's the difference between them because if you don't define your terms you can't even have a conversation well, I would agree with you. That can be very difficult to do that. Um, an active force, for me, is is something which makes something happen, and something which is an enabler and an actor. Okay, so uh, and, you would be an active yeah. force, and the Father, God the Father, would be an active well, yeah, force, could, and Jesus I, would I be an active be, force. I could be. An, I could be. Yes, because, because they I, make things happen. It's interesting that the possessive is consistently used of, of the Spirit as belonging specifically to Jehovah God. So in that regard, you see, it would be a little bit like me, rather than saying that I was the active force, but saying that um, you know my arm was the active force because it was my arm that enacted something to happen, or that I caused something to happen in some way. But I mean, I see, I see where you. I mean, I mean, I mean what is the official? I'm not really bothered about what you think. What is the official teaching of the Watchtower Society about God's active force? Well, if you were to have a little look, for instance, I, I don't know if you have access to, you've used our website there. Um, I'm not sure which of the... I other have to go to a public apps. place to use it because I don't have the internet at home. All right, okay. Okay, in that case, there's no point in me giving you a reference no. um, on that. Okay. But um, you, you can, I've got a pen beside me. You can give me the reference if you tell me the literature and I can write it down. And then look yeah, it up well, in my own instance, time. Are you aware of that? We have a publication called um, Insight on the Scripture. Yes, of course I've looked at that, yes. Yeah, yeah OK. Yeah. But it, okay. Doesn't, it, uh, it doesn't really define what an active force is and what All a right. person is and what the difference is between them. I think I know... I, I think that what your literature is saying is the, the Holy Spirit is impersonal, like a rock or a stone or electricity or oh. the wind. It's impersonal. Whereas um, a person would have the four aspects of personality, self-cognizance, which means you recognize your own existence when you speak and say I or me, um, self-will, intellect and emotion. People who are persons would possess those four things, self-cognizance, self-will, intellect and emotion. Something that's impersonal and, and, would and not. Another important fact as well would be free will as well. Well, if you have self-will... To express self-will, that would include free will, wouldn't it? It would to some extent, and there's an interesting aspect of how the Holy Spirit is portrayed. It's always portrayed as being at God's command or at God's gift, and expressly doing what God does. Now, you could say the same of Jesus, of course, but when Jesus does that, it's, it's very clearly an act of free will. It was his will to do those things. And to, to work in harmony with his father. The, the Holy Spirit's not yes. spoken of in those terms, to the best of my knowledge. Um, Michael, would you believe the Holy Spirit possesses self will or, or not? Um, I would believe that the Holy Spirit always acts under the direction or at the behest of God. So does the Holy Spirit possess self will? I, I don't believe it does, no. Okay. And, and would he have a mind? Would he have intellect, for instance? I, I don't believe it would, and I specifically use the word. Because you did make reference to the Greek earlier on, and so, sorry, I didn't, I didn't get get that. Sorry. Um, um, I, I, I would say that it does. Yes, have. Um, sorry, what was your question again? Um, I got myself does the Holy mind. Spirit possess a mind? Um, that's an interesting question. I'm not entirely sure. How would you define that? If you mean in terms of a personality, in terms of an individual. Um, being, then I, I would say perhaps not, but um, yeah, that's a kind of knee-jerk reaction. A, a mind, the ability to think, the ability to reason. It might well, not be a physical uh, brain, but it would do the same function. No, no, I, I realise to... you're not saying the physical brain. I mean, and I'm, I'm not saying, knowledge. no, I'm, I'm, not saying the, I'm not saying the Holy Spirit has a physical brain, but I'm saying, does the Holy Spirit possess a mind, the ability to think, the ability to reason? Um, oh, I would have to think about that, actually. Yeah. What do you 
Um, well, if he does, then he would be personal, wouldn't he? Because the yeah. wind, or electricity, or a rock, or a stone, uh -huh. can't possess yeah, a mind, yeah. can't possess can a will, um, couldn't possess... I'm trying to think of an instance could I in which the Holy Spirit is, is, is depicted as exercising that mind, as it were, and separate of, or, or, or without direction from God, or indeed from Jesus himself, because he gives the Holy Spirit an occasion. What about emotion? Would the Holy Spirit possess emotion? Can he love? Can he be insulted? He can be grieved. The Holy Spirit can be grieved. How can you grieve? That's Isaiah 63.10. How can you grieve something that's impersonal, like a rock or a stone or the oh, wind or electricity? I, I, I was talking, you cut me off again. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not meaning to cut you off. I thought you were... Yeah. Okay, I'll yeah. go on. Um, can you... Can something that is impersonal love, or be grieved, or be insulted, or be blasphemed. Thank you. Well, something can be blasphemed, it can be tongued again, yeah, and be spoken again, yeah. And it's that blasphemy that leads to the grief, is it not? I mean, I mean, how would the Bible have to read if the Holy Spirit were a person, were personal, the word person means personal. It doesn't mean the Holy Spirit is a human being. Um, I'm not saying the Holy Spirit is a human being like us. But if the Holy Spirit is personal, how would the Bible have to read to tell us that the Holy Spirit is personal? Hmm, that's an interesting question. I don't really have an answer for that. I suppose on the basis of what I've said so far, it would suggest, it would suggest that acting in some way that showed it had some freedom of choice. Um, think, for instance, of Jesus on the night before his, um, his um, execution, mm -hmm. uh, praying, not my will, but yours. But, you know, but also uh, realizing the enormity of what was lying ahead of him and expressing, uh, as it were, a wish that it wasn't going to happen. But nonetheless, submitting himself to God's will, that was therefore an act of free will. Um, perhaps some similar expression on the part of the Holy Spirit would give some indication of that. Um, the, the Holy Spirit can speak and say, me and I. Now that's called self-cognizance. You recognize your own existence. When I say, hello, I am here. I am speaking to you on my phone. When I say, I am here, I use the pronoun I. I recognize my own existence. That's called self-cognizance. I recognize that I'm, that I'm cognate. Mm -hmm. I recognize that I exist. Would you have a, a reference for that? Yeah, Acts 13.2. Do you want to read it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, give me a second. I'll just look it up. Okay, yeah. As we were ministering to Jehovah and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set aside for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. To which, now the Holy Spirit said, so it's not the Father speaking to, through the Holy Spirit, it's the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. speaking. The Holy Spirit said, now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. He uses the pronoun I. He is self-cognizant. He recognizes his own existence. It's an interesting thought. He possesses self-will. A few chapters later in Acts 16.6, 6, um, he forbids Paul to preach in Asia. Now, when they had gone through the region of Figuria and the region of Galicia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. So in Acts 16, 6, the Holy Spirit has self-will. Is that self-will or was that um, an expression of God's will? No, because it's, it's the Holy Spirit. I know it doesn't mention God, but I'm just putting forward that possibility. They were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in oh. Asia. It doesn't say they were forbidden by God the Father through the Holy Spirit or something. It's the Holy no, Spirit. It it, no, I don't disagree with you. It doesn't say that. The Holy Spirit has a mind in Romans 8.27. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. So the Holy Spirit has a mind, Romans 8.27. And the Holy Spirit possesses emotions such as love. He loves people. 
Now I beg you, uh, Romans 15 verse 13, Now I beg you, brethren, through the Lord Jesus Christ and through the love of the Spirit, that you strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. So the Holy Spirit loves Romans 15 30. How can something that is impersonal like the wind or a stone or a rock or electricity love? Um, and then the others I'm sure you know about, that you can grieve the Holy Spirit, Isaiah 63.10, which you refer to. We can insult the Holy Spirit, Hebrews 10.29. You can only insult a person. You can't insult an, an impersonal it, like electricity. You can't go over to your light switch and say, I hate you, electricity. You're horrible, electricity. I hate you. And then turn your light switch on and off and say, I hate you, electricity. You can't insult something that's impersonal, such as the wind, electricity, or a rock or a stone. But you can insult the Holy Spirit at Hebrews 10.29. Yeah, I mean, you can certainly grieve the Holy Spirit by coming against the God that you see and insulting the Holy Spirit by refusing mm -hmm. to accept its power. Yeah. And you can blaspheme the Holy Spirit in Mark chapter 3, I think it is, mm -hmm. verse 28 and 29. Mm -hmm. um, the Holy Spirit in Mark chapter 3, I think it is, verse 28 and 29. Well, how can you blaspheme something that is not personal, that's, that's impersonal? Oh, I think you can, if it comes from God, you most certainly can. Yeah. No, it's, it's not insulting. It's remarkable that it's given up. It doesn't say they have insulted God or they've insulted the Father or God the no, Father. No, and in fact, it's very specific. It says that you'll be forgiven for insulting God and insulting God. Yes, but it says, you won't yeah, be, yeah. it says you won't be forgiven if you insult the Holy Spirit. Um, and it mentions does Holy mean, Spirit. Does that mean then that has primacy over the Father and the Son? Pardon? Does that give the Spirit primacy over the... Primacy? Yeah, does it make it more important than the oh, Father no, and the Son? No, why is it... no, 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 no. That's why I'm, I'm just pointing out that the Holy Spirit yeah. can be blasphemed, and you can only blaspheme a person or someone or something, someone who is personal. You can't blaspheme ah, an yes. impersonal it like electricity or a rock. You can't blaspheme a rock. I mean, I've got you my... You can't blaspheme a rock, you yes. know, but you can blaspheme a purpose and you can blaspheme against um, a direction that you've been given. And you are certainly given that direction by the Holy Spirit. You, you, you can only blaspheme God. You, you can't blaspheme something that is impersonal. Let me just read it. Mark chapter 3, 28 and 29. Assuredly, I say to you, all sins will be will be forgiven the sons of men and whatever blasphemies they they may utter but he who blasphemes against the holy spirit never has forgiveness but is subject to eternal condemnation so the holy spirit can be blasphemed well if you put that together doesn't that mean the holy spirit is personal rather than impersonal he has self cognizance because he can speak and say i in romans in acts 13:2 he has self-will in Romans chapter 16, verse 6. He has intellect, i.e. he has a mind, because we read of the mind of the Spirit in Romans eight twenty-seven. And the most convincing for me is he has emotion. He can love us, Romans fifteen thirty. He can be grieved, Isaiah sixty three ten. He can be insulted, Hebrews ten twenty nine, And he can be blasphemed, Mark 3 28 29 i don't see how this can be applicable to something that is impersonal such as the wind or electricity these these attributes self-cognition self-will intellect and emotion apply to persons not well, to something that is impersonal yeah you said self-will but i mean do they demonstrate self-will or do they demonstrate an enactment of god's will uh, is, that not where, is that not where the blasphemy comes in as much as someone is resisting the force that is trying to move them in the direction of God's will? Is that not where the blasphemy happens? Um, Acts 16, 6. Now, when they had gone through Figuria and the region of Galicia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word okay. in Asia. So the Holy Spirit forbade them to preach in Asia. It doesn't say the Father through the Holy Spirit forbade them to preach yeah. in Asia. It's the Holy Spirit who forbade them to preach in Asia. So the Holy Spirit there demonstrates self-will. Um, it's very much an expression of God's will in that case, is it not? I mean, is the, is the Holy Spirit 
acting as an independent agent in this? Is that what that verse shows? I believe throughout the whole Bible, Father, Son and Holy Spirit work together. I don't believe um, Father, Son or Holy Spirit work independently of each other. I do not accept that, no. But I'm just reading the text. It says the Holy Spirit forbade them. Yeah, I know. They were forbidden. I know what it says. Can I finish? Yeah. I've they, got in front of me as well. They were and it was the Holy Spirit that was communicating that to them. Yeah. I, I don't disagree with that. But I'm not sure that then to then say that that therefore means that the Holy Spirit has this element of personality is necessarily the key. I'm not sure you can use that to argue the key. They were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia, Acts 16.6. 6. So isn't the Holy Spirit forbidding them to preach in Asia? Isn't he expressing self-will? And I'm not entirely sure that he is. No, not in the way that, for instance, Jesus discussed the possibility of um, doing something in another way from God, if he already was never going to actually do that. What, what is that self-will? Of, I'm not sure that element of free will is there in the case of the Holy Spirit. No, no, I I'm didn't say... Sure that you demonstrate that. Michael, I didn't say free will, I said self-will. The Holy really? Spirit demonstrates self-will, his own will. In Acts 16.6, 6, Now when they had gone through Figuria and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. My, my point is, the Holy Spirit here is said to, exp to forbid them to preach in Asia. That's self-will. He's expressing something he wants them to do. Do not preach the word in Asia. That, that's my only point. Yeah, I, I realise that's your point, and, and as I'm saying, I'm not entirely agreeing with that. I don't feel that necessarily does express that sense of self, or in the sense that it doesn't demonstrate. I'm not saying it, it, it demonstrates other I'm simply saying that to then take that and say, therefore, the Holy Spirit has this self will, I'm afraid I feel he's going too far. Maybe we'll have to disagree on that. Um, how would the Bible have to read to convince you that the Holy Spirit has self will? I, mean, well, I, think I, I think I answered that already when I gave an example and from the, the words of Jesus that demonstrates his self -worth. Just, Just speak a bit more slowly because I'm trying to listen to what you're saying. So, yeah, how I, would as, I said, as I said, I think I answered that earlier when I referred you to the idea of what Jesus said that demonstrated his sense of self uh, What was your point? You speak a bit quickly. Oh, uh, well, <laughs> okay. Um, my point was that um, when Jesus was praying on the night before his death, yes. he discussed that, albeit in abstract, ah. the possibility of something else happening. Right. We don't do that with the Holy Spirit. We, we see it invariably, invariably expressing God's will. You, you must, I must insist on one thing. If you're going to quote the Bible to me, you read the passage. I'm very insistent on that. I don't accept paraphrases. So where is that passage? Not my will, well, but yours be done. I, well, you can probably refer to it more quickly than I can. I suspect you obviously have a, a very fine knowledge of the scriptures. I'm looking at Luke 23. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's... No, it's not there. Here we are, Luke twenty two forty two, saying, Father, if it is your will, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. So Jesus has um, a will here. It's his human will that he's referring to. And when he says your will, he's referring to the will that the Father would share together with the Son and the Holy Spirit. In other words, he's contrasting his human will with the divine will. There aren't three divine wills. There aren't three divine minds. God has one mind and one will. And here in Luke twenty-two forty-two, Jesus is, when he says, not my will, that's his human will, because Jesus has two natures. I believe he's fully God and fully man. But yours be done. So he's contrasting his human will with the Father's will or the divine will. I would see it as that was Jesus expressing, as you say quite rightly, his will at that moment. He didn't particularly relish what lay ahead of him, and I don't blame him. But nonetheless, he was willing to submit to the will of his father because he yes. knew the importance yes. of what was going on. Yes, absolutely. From, but surely so when he says... We, we agree upon that. So for me, a similar... Could, a could, similar I, could I just comment... Could I, no, before we, could I comment on that? Helpful. 
could I comment on that verse? When he says, not my will, wouldn't you agree mm -hmm. with me that's Jesus' human will? I agree with you, that's Jesus' will. Yeah. yeah, and when he says, but yours be done, he's referring to the, the Father's will, the divine will. Yeah, Agreed? He, he, accept his father's, he accepts his Father's will. Absolutely. Okay, so there's two wills, Jesus' human will and the divine will. So all he's doing is contrasting his human will and saying, I'm not going to do my human will, but your will, meaning the divine will, that will be done. So we, we agree on that. Now, that verse yeah. is totally think, unrelated to the Holy Spirit. It bears no relationship whatsoever to well, Acts 16.6, where the Holy Spirit expresses his will. Um, he, the Holy Spirit forbids them to preach the word in Asia in Acts 16.6. So the Holy Spirit has a will. The Holy Spirit forbids them to so preach the word in Asia. So what was God's will for them at that time? The, I... the Father, Son and Holy Spirit would have the same will. Okay. Because God has one will. One mind, one being, one essence, one mind, one will. So all three persons of the Trinity would share the same one will. The only point I'm trying to make is that they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. I, I, that means that the Holy Spirit that is expressing self-will. He's, he's saying, I want you not to do something. That's called self-will. Yeah, certainly the Holy Spirit is, is the one that gave them the, the direction there. Yeah, that's no doubt about that. Yeah. I mean, whatever. I think, I, I think I think to then take that and say, therefore, the Holy Spirit is is a is a person or a personality and distinct, as it were, from God. Although I, you would see it also as being a part of God, I presume. And I, I think that would be extrapolating a little too much from the verse. I, I I do not believe that God has parts. I don't believe that. I've never said that. And the Trinitarian creeds don't do not teach that. They teach the opposite oh, of that. They teach. Me, I'm not actually an expert on the Trinity. Well, I'm not an expert either, but I know enough to know that I'm not going to defend. Um, I'm not going to defend um, statements which are anti-Trinitarian, as if I have to sort of defend them. Um, the claim that God has parts is is not a Trinitarian teaching. How would the Bible have to read? To or what, what is there in the Bible that, that shows us that the Holy Spirit is impersonal, that the Holy Spirit isn't it? Because I've given you four reasons. I mean, I, I do have a fifth one, actually. But I've given you four reasons why I believe the Holy Spirit is personal. Um, by the term person, what I mean is not a human being. OK, because the Holy Spirit's not a human being. I mean, he's personal. He has self-cognizance, self-will, intellect and emotion. Where in the Bible does the Bible tell me that the Holy Spirit is impersonal, like the wind or electricity, as you, you claim, Michael? Um, well, I think we use those as illustrations. Well, impersonal, yes, and we use wind or electricity as an illustration. Um, no, I don't know if I would be able to provide a verse that says that the Holy Spirit is not personal. Uh, no, I don't think I would be able to do that. Well, why should I believe that, then, if you can't give me a verse? Well, I mean, if I look at um, I look at the verses that are there, and if I look at the way that the Holy Spirit is described as acting, then what I find there is this concept of this, as the, the phrase that you, you feel you don't define very well, this active force, God's finger, God's hand at work, God's agency, if you wish, of power. Um, these things, uh, well, that's what I find the Holy Spirit being described as. Now, but you have given me some of it, you have given me some very interesting references, yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, I thank you for that, so I'm going to have a look at those. Okay, well, um, look, um, perhaps it's best then if I leave it there. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, Michael, I, I do appreciate you spending some, some time with this. No, it's OK. Um, That's okay. Uh, to, to speak to me again, it's best to text me well in advance with an actual time and day, because I'm, I'm here, there and everywhere. Oh, yeah, OK. Uh, you, you've used the number for People's Congregation, and can I ask where did you get that? Or was it from our website, or yes. was it somewhere else? Yes, um, you go to jw.org and then find a congregation. Yes, yes. Uh, I, I'm just interested if you're down south how you ended up phoning people. Well, it was a, it was um, I think it was a mobile phone number. Mm -hmm. Um, because yeah, yeah, no, it, it is. It's a 
mobile phone number, I mean, basically because of COVID-19, um, most of us are not using, well, we're not using our kingdom homes mm. at the moment, so the contact numbers we're providing are mobile numbers, yes. just the, these things at the moment. Because sometimes yeah. the landline yeah. numbers, nobody answers those phone. I have tried, nearer to me. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. Yeah, yes. well, that's why we've got uh, mobile numbers provided. Um, yes. and, and that's, uh, we're doing that at the moment because of COVID. Normally we would have a, a landline with, um, with maybe an answer machine actually physically in the Kingdom Hall. Yes. Um, which would be available. Yeah. But uh, it's not practical at the moment. I, um was a bit shocked at a statement because I have been doing using the search engine and I looked at the JW.org website and one of the watchtowers for the 1st of September 1988, page 13, paragraph 2. I've got the reference here. I've made a note of it. It says the watchtower states that Jesus and Lucifer are former angelic brothers. And I was kind of shocked. I don't believe that my saviour, Jesus, is the former brother of Lucifer, now now called Satan. I don't believe they were brothers. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, no, but then that's because you view Jesus as not being a created being, is that correct? I believe his human body, his humanity, was created 2,000 years ago in Mary's womb. Um, yeah. But I believe that Jesus is not an angel. Um, perhaps this could be a subject for another discussion. Uh, I, I know Satan is an angel, a fallen angel. But um, Jesus is described in Hebrews 1.4 as being so much better than the angels. So how can Jesus be an angel if he's... Um, Hebrews 1, Paul, having become so much better than the angels, he has by by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. And then that the next was, verse... That was, a, that was after his resurrection. After his resurrection. But that, but the, but the, that, might, that might indeed be a very interesting topic for discussion. Yeah, but the next verse is even clearer. For to which of the angels did he ever say, this is prophetic, quoting Psalm 2, which is um, um, 1000 BC, I think it's the Psalm of David, Quote, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And um, it's prophetic of Christ becoming king, which would have happened at his resurrection, but it's, it's given in Psalm 2, written about, well, probably not, uh, probably about 950 BC by King David. Um, and begotten there, the context for that is um, when you became a king in ancient Israel, it was called your begetting. So Christ is not an angel, He's God's son, which means he shares his father's nature. Because verse 5 says, For to which of the angels did he ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you. He said that to Jesus. So therefore Jesus isn't an angel. He wasn't an angel when the psalm was written in 950 BC. Because it says, For to which of the angels did he say. Yeah. Okay, well we'll leave that for some other time. Thank you very much, Michael. Okay, you take care, Robert. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.